Thank you. Um, Masaki Kobayashi is a clinical fellow in geriatrics at Rochester Regional Health System. He's worked as an attending internal medicine and geriatric medicine physician in Japan. And in addition, as a research fellow in Japan, he's conducted some clinical trials about multimodal comprehensive care communication skills training for elderly patients with dementia. So he's gonna tell us a lot about that today. A really invaluable um, uh, presentation on multimodal comprehensive care communication skills in dementia care. And welcome Dr. Kobayashi. Thank you so much for introduction. It's a great honor to be here today. So I'm Masaki Kobayashi. So I'm from Japan. I trained and practiced in Japan for 15 years, and I was an internal medicine and a geriatric medicine attending, followed by a geriatric research fellow in Japan. So I came here from Japan uh, last year. So I've been working as a geriatric medicine fellow at Rochester Regional Health System in order to run US-based geriatric care. So I have no financial disclosures. Um, this is a Mount Fuji, uh, the highest peak in Japan. <laughs> so I will talk about multimodal comprehensive care communication skills in dementia care. And through my presentation, you will be able to understand the importance of communication skills for healthcare workers caring for patients with dementia, and to learn how to apply the humanity method in daily clinical practice. And also you'll be able to learn uh, to describe and understand the clinical impact of multimodal comprehensive care communication skills. So before talking about communication skills in dementia care, I will talk a little bit about the reason I'm interested in communication skills in dementia care. So here are the population pyramids of Japan and the United States in 2020. And when you compare these two, you can see that the Japanese society is aging more rapidly than the United States. So elderly population in Japan is more than twice the young population. The birth rate is 1.3 in Japan. On the other hand, the birth rate is 1.7 in the United States. So that in the United States, 16% of the population in 2020 was over 65. So Japan is a rapidly aging society. And as you can see, the pyramid for Japan shows an aging population with the majority of the people aged between about 30 and 70. So elderly population in Japan is more than twice than the young population. And on the other hand, pyramid for United States shows working age population is more than 60% of total population. So elderly population in the United States is the same as the young population. So this is an estimated the prevalence of dementia per 1000 population. So these are prevalence of dementia in 2015. The arrows on the top of the bars uh, are projected prevalence by year 2035. According to the estimate for the number of people with dementia in member nations of the OECD report, both the prevalence of dementia and its a future rate of growth in Japan are highest among these nations. As you can see, in 2035, 
the number of people with dementia in Japan can be increased by two times compared with the United States. So through my clinical experiences in Japan, I often faced the difficulty caring for patients with dementia or patients with delirium who resisted care from medical staff. And I noticed that their care resistance behaviors valid depending on how to communicate with patients. And also through my research experiences in Japan, I realized that importance of verbal and nonverbal communication to build good relationships between patients and healthcare workers. So I wanted to know more about the communication with dementia patients with diverse backgrounds. So when I was wondering how best we could communicate with patients with dementia, I watched a Japanese video that made a great impact on me when I first watched the video. So I will show you the typical case that medical staff struggle to care for patients in Japan. So this is a video about a 94 year old man with a hip fracture who resisted oral care. So this is what happens in his usual care. <laughs> お口の掃除。お掃除しましょう。お口の中。あーって So older people with dementia struggle to interact smoothly with their caregivers. So as I mentioned before, through my clinical experiences, I sometimes struggle in caring for patients with dementia who resisted care because we could not provide adequate medical care and treatment. So I believe that communication skill training in caring for patients with dementia for healthcare workers and family caregivers is becoming increasingly important in modern society. So we all know that all healthcare professionals in geriatrics are very passionate about geriatric care and dementia care, but caring for geriatric patients with progressive dementia can cause high levels of stress, burnout, and low empathy among caregivers and healthcare workers. And the pandemic has disproportionately affected the geriatric population resulting in an increased mortality rate. So this meant added workload for healthcare workers in geriatric medicine, resulting in an increased burnout rate among healthcare workers. So in order to address this situation, and guide healthcare interaction with older adults, we have four M's. 
So many of you might be unfamiliar with the concept of the four M's. The, the four M model was developed by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement to provide high quality care to all their adults through the four, four elements, mentation, mobility, medications, and what matters most. So what matters most to the patient as an individual? Medications to make sure that polypharmacy issues are not negatively affecting the patient's other three M's. And the mentation to ensure a psychological health by preventing and managing dementia, depression, and delirium. And finally, mobility, so that the patient can re remain functional in order to do what matters. So in order to practice these four M's, the most important thing for us to do is to make sure that we'll build a strong relationship between patients and the caregivers, including as healthcare workers. So as you know, um, effective communication is a fundamental element to build a relationship between patient and the healthcare workers and ensure the provision of quality care. And in contrast, communication that is fragmented or interrupted may impact negatively on patient functioning, comfort, and safety. But however, there's a lack of evidence regarding educational interventions to improve communication in care settings in which people with dementia are cared for. So before um, I show you another clip, please remember this screenshot from the video that you just saw. So again, so this is a 94, Ill old man with hip fracture who resisted all care despite three nurses trying. So in this video, the fourth nurse was finally able to provide oral care successfully. <laughs> インストラクターが苦労していた さっぱりしましたか。はい。さっぱりいたしました。久しぶりっていうか何年かぶりにですね、あの笑顔を見させてもらいました。非常に感激しています。昨日までこんなに寝た姿だけ見てなかったんですけども、本当になんか別人になった
who are French physical education teachers. So they began working in a hospital to train hospital staff in ways to prevent back pain and how to properly move patients. But they were disappointed to see how many, how many patients were bedridden and how few staff patients interaction occurred. So during their previous role in physical education, he taught his students that bodily movement is necessary to staying healthy. However, what he saw at the hospitals was the opposite of his, his teaching. So patients were restrained and were not talked to. So through their challenging experience, they worked with over 30,000 patients and they founded Humani, Humanitu, which comprised 400 practical methods to support patients and help them retain their humanity. It has been currently used at over 600 hospitals and nursing homes across Europe. And my mentor, Dr. Miwako Honda, who trained in geriatrics in the United States, brought Humanitu to Japan about 10 years ago. So Humanitu involves a multi-model comprehensive care communication skills, and it emphasizes the development of good relationships between caregivers and the care receivers. And it also respects the human liberty, autonomy, and dignity of those who receive care. And humanity is a relationship-centered care and not a person-centered care. A person-centered care is an integrated healthcare delivered in a setting and a manner based on the patient's goals, values, and preferences. And our relationship-centered care is based on the connection between caregivers and the care receivers. So if we, so if we don't connect with patients, we cannot provide person-centered care. So Humanitude uh, began in France and has since spread across the world, but it's uh, still uncommon in the United States. Um, Humanitude provided a workshops for healthcare workers in Oregon and Texas in the past. And Humanitude has been currently applied extensively in several settings, including hospital and nursing homes in Europe, uh, including France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Switzerland, Germany, and Belgium, and also Canada and Asia, including Singapore, South Korea, and Japan. So hopefully it will spread across the United States as well. So next I'm moving on the multi-model comprehensive care communication skills. So this method focuses on four elements of communication with patients. Face-to-face -face interaction, verbal communication, and a touch interaction, and the assistance of standing up. And the multimodal comprehensive means a combination of each communication modalities. So specifically, the caregivers should always use at least two out of three modes of communication at the same time, including face-to-face -face interaction, verbal communication, and attached interaction. 
So for example, so we should use face-to-face -face interaction and verbal communication. Or um, we should use face-to-face -face interaction and a touch interaction, something like that. So first, a uh, face-to-face interaction. <clears throat> so eye contact is a core element in the humanitude. The object of eye contact is to help patients with dementia continue to pay attention to caregivers since patients are easily distracted by other stimulation, such as other individuals, other objects. And in humanitude, these efforts to preserve continuous eye contact can lead to smoother interaction with patients with dementia. And other elements are geometric and temporal characteristics in face-to-face -face interaction. The humanitude points out the importance of geometric properties when caregivers make eye contact with patients with dementia. The impression per perceived by patients depends on how the eye contact is made. So when, I, when eye contact is established from the front and the, eye, the same eye level, it creates a positive impression. And eye contact from the side of the face creates a negative impression. So humanitude also discusses the distance between caregivers and the patient with dementia during eye contact. So closely distance create intimacy and trust in patients. And the humanitude recommend an eye contact distance that is closer than the distance generally observed in adult communication. That is around 20, 30 centimeter. So now let's look at this screenshot from the previous video. So do you think that patient saw the nurse who walked towards him? So as you can see, the patient is staring in the opposite direction from the nurse who approached him. So next, the verbal communication. So phonetic information includes tone, speed, and volume. So patients um, with dementia have sometimes difficulty in understanding the meaning of linguistic information. However, their amygdala essentially analyzes emotional meaning of paralinguistic information. So hearing loss is the highest population attributable factor for dementia. So people taking care of patients with dementia have a tendency to speak loud and a high pitch voice to communicate. But these tones convey negative emotional prosody to patients. So to avoid this condition, humanity recommend to calm slow, gentle, and low voice. And another category of verbal communication is vocabulary. So vocabulary is critical to convey positive information. So to establish a good relationship with patients, selecting positive words is a key. So for example, by adding a positive emphasis, Thank you very much for keeping your mouth open. That is a big help. Something like that. So how about this screenshot from previous video? So you notice that the patient is not making any eye contact. 
And also, did you also notice that the nurses were asking him to open his mouth, speaking louder and louder? So how do you think this made the patient with dementia feel? Don't you think this made him even more confused? So next, the touch interaction. So touching plays an important role in communication with patients. So touch interaction is an opportunity for communication to develop good relationships. A person brings positive or a negative meaning to another, depending on the kind of touch, how it is performed. A friendly attitude and intimate relationship must be maintained before and during touching because touching behavior may influence on the person's privacy, such as changing diapers or potentially invasive medical procedures. So, so for this reason, you monitor, determine the techniques, how to touch patients in the care. And I will introduce how to approach the touch. So aggressive touches are never acceptable and must be avoided. So necessary touch must be made as comfortable as possible. So for example, to avoid to avoid conveying negative information, caregivers should not approach the arm of a patient with grabbing from above. So they should approach their arm to support from below. And also a touch place. The touch place is important. So tactile stimulation are received by the brain's sensory cortex. So as you can see here, the size of receptive area depending on the body part. The area corresponding to the hands, face, and the mouth is large. The area corresponding to the legs and arms is small. So even if we touch a person in the same way, the effect on care receiver's brain will be different depending on which part was touched. So therefore, to avoid startling a patient with dementia by suddenly receiving too much information, caregivers should first test the parts that convey less information, which are, uh, which are the upper arms, shoulder, and back. And sensitive areas should only be touched when absolutely necessary, the hands, face, and a genital region. So this is the final screenshot from the previous video. So what do you see here? What do you think is going on? So if you look at the red circle, you can see that one of the nurses is trying to forcefully grab his arm. So we know that the nurses are trying very hard to help the patient. But how do you think this patient feels? How would you feel if someone you don't see starts speaking louder, louder at you, and then later gloves your arm and try to force something in your mouth. Doesn't that sound scary? So that's why we need to communication technique to build a relationship between caregivers and care receivers.
So this uh, uh, next uh, assistance of standing up. So as you know, we have to pay attention to the harmful effect of prolonged bed rest on other adults. The amount of information from peripheral receptors about the position and the perception is more in upright than supine. The patient with cognitive decline shows a significantly more arousal and awareness in the upright position than bedridden. The main goal of humanitude is to maintain the health of all their adults and allow them to live a life with dignity by helping them stand and walk. And another goal is to accumulate the duration of standing up 20 minutes per day to prevent being bedridden. So in fact, Humanitude offers many techniques that provide working assistance. The key is letting older adults stand and work by themselves to maximize their muscle strengths. So during the standing up and working assistance, the caregivers should always use more than two out of three modes of communication elements, face-to-face -face interaction, verbal communication, and touch interactions to present a consistent and a positive stimulation. So next, I will introduce you the clinical effects of Humanitude program. So we conducted clinical trials evaluating the efficacy of Humanitude program for healthcare workers and family caregivers. So first, um, we worked on research about the effect of Humanitude program for nurses on both delirium and the physical restraint in intensive care unit. So our study showed that the incidence of delirium significantly decreased by 80%. And the use of physical restraint significantly decreased to half. And the next, uh, we conducted research about the effect of humanitude program on oral healthcare professionals' empathy for patients with dementia. So as I showed the previous video about the patient with hip fracture, patient with dementia often resisted oral care. So our study showed that or healthcare professionals' empathy scores were increased post-training, and then training improved the oral health of patients with dementia. So we consider that the patients accepted oral care because of an increased oral healthcare professionals' empathy, which led to the decreased refusal of oral care. Oh, sorry. And next, uh, we conducted research about the effect of humanitude program for family caregivers, uh, people with dementia at home. So we provided training for family caregivers over three months. And then the program included lectures, demonstrations, and role-playing workshops. After each training session, caregivers received weekly postcard with tips on daily care based on humanitude. So our study showed that the care burden of family caregivers was significantly decreased post-training and the behavior and psychological symptoms of people with dementia significantly improved after three months.
And also this is a data of the French National Institute system about a psychotropic drug prescription in patients with dementia at nursing home in France. So from left to right, the far left one shows uh, institution where Umanitru was being used. The middle bar is a regional average. And the right bar represents France, the whole country. And the psychotropic drugs were almost never prescribed for residents in the institution in using humanitarian methods. And the disease severities and the care need level among three groups were same national averages in France. So our clinical trial results show that we are able to achieve better clinical outcome by using humanitarian methods for healthcare workers and family caregivers. But humanitarian is proposed based on experience, not evidence. So we've analyzed the reason why humanitarian contribute to better clinical outcomes. So I worked on research collaborating with physicians, informatics specialists, and psychologists. So this project was funded by the Japanese government. Um, the grant was awarded in the amount of 3.8 million US dollars over six years. So in order to understand the humanitarian methods, our team is working on two approaches. So computational approach to analyze the physical behavior of caregivers and neuroscientific approach to know how and why you monitor the methods work. So our team's goal is to analyze communication and to develop reproduction methods of communication. So at first, we recorded videos about what happened in caregiver's care, and then we measure the interaction and the communication of the care. Our researchers also annotate the interaction and communication such as eye contact, verbal, and touch. Based on the annotation, we developed an automatic evaluation system that analyzes caregiver's behavior and communication by artificial intelligence. So next, I will introduce the evaluation system that analyzes caregiver's behavior and communication by artificial intelligence. So we developed a video analyzing system for physician behavior in acute care, acute care hospital. So we worked on research about the efficacy of humanitude program for physicians and analyzed the, their behavior. And we analyzed the amount of each communication and the multimodal communication when they did physical exam for a simulated patient. So this is a comparison before and after training. The top row shows the bird's eye view from the third person's point of view. The lower left box shows the physician's point of view. And the lower right box show the simulated patient's point of view. So let's see what happened before the training. Oh, 
So before the training, as you can see, most of the patient's point of view only show the ceiling. So let's see what happened after the training. So before the training, the doctor's face does not appear in the patient's point of view camera. But after the training, as you can see, you can now see the doctor's face. So this is a timeline showing the lengths of each communication that occurred for one of the physicians. The timeline were mapped for all the physicians and were calculated each communication. And based on the timeline, the length of each communication was increased post training. And furthermore, multimodal communication, which is at least two out of three components of communication, was significantly increased by roughly three times after you monitored the program. And we found that we can analyze each communication using artificial intelligence and also that physician can use multimodal communication through the training. And also we also evaluated physician's empathy and burnout through the Humanitude program. These are changes in empathy scores and numbers of reported burnouts from pre and post training. The empathy scores showed a statistically significant improved from pre-training to post-training. The number of physicians with burnout decreased after the training. So our another goal is to develop education system of communications and to contribute to society. So based on the clinical data, we developed the education system of Humanitude. The aim of this system is to provide a basic skills training to improve patient care for students, medical professionals, and family caregivers. So I will introduce the three education systems. So first, uh, we created the um, education system by using a video lecture for physicians. So we provided video lectures about the concepts and the methods of humanitude for physicians in acute care hospital. In addition, we provided bedside training with humanitude instructors for physicians. And next, um, an iPad was used for the second education system. So this is an online coaching system that was developed as a care education system for family caregivers at home. So first, family caregivers received on-site training and learned how to use an iPad. And next, they recorded care for people with dementia on the iPad at home. And then they sent the, they sent the video to their instructors and they received feedback. And then finally, family caregivers reviewed the feedback video and the practice care home, practice care at home.
And then third education system is a simulated communication training using augmented reality with real-time feedback. The superimposed the three-dimensional computer graphic of a patient's face onto the head of the mannequin by augmented reality technology. The facial expression of the AL patient were dynamically controlled by their um, caregiver's movement. The eye contact, verbal communication, and touch interaction between patient and the caregivers were detected and evaluated by the system and feedback to the caregiver's head mount display in real time. And if there's no face-to-face -to -face interaction or verbal communication in 10 seconds, the warning starts. The virtual patients react based on the caregiver's interaction. So let's see the video. No communication. So we worked on a clinical trial about this simulation training using augmented reality system for nursing students in Japan. And also, I, uh, I was presented at Alzheimer Association International Conference last year. So the, me this, the method is uh, 25 students, uh, nursing students, enrolled and learned standardized humanitude skills using a textbook. And then they were randomly assigned to augmented reality training or conventional nursing mannequin training. And each group received a one hour training to change the classes of mannequins. In AR group, I will explain again, the superimposed three dimensional computer graphic of a patient's face onto the head of the mannequin by augmented reality technology. The facial expression of the AL patient by, dynam by dynamically controlled by the participant's movement. The eye contact, verbal communication, and a touch interaction between patient and the participants were detected and evaluated by the system and the feedback to patients had bound display in real time. On the other hand, the conventional group had the set of training with nursing mannequin, as, as in the traditional nursing training. So all nursing students perform basic nursing, nursing care to uh, simulate patients before and after the training, which were video recorded and the quantitative communication skills were analyzed by artificial intelligence. Additionally, their empathy to patients by was evaluated. And here's a result on the right side. After the training, the proportion of time spent on eye contact in the AR group uh, significantly increased than the conventional group. And interestingly enough, the empathy scores significantly increased in the AR group while it was worsened in the conventional group. So this may be because the AR group received affected feedback from the avatar through positive and a negative facial expressions, while the conventional group did not receive any feedback. So the, um, this study finding indicate that AL-based skill training system had a great impact on the participants and the nursing students acquisition of both communication skills and empathy for dementia care. 
So this system is interesting because uh, this system is innovative, cross-dressed, and not time-consuming. And it's also very useful to understand to communication skills in nursing uh, education. So you monitor the school training program is included in the curriculum for some medical schools and nursing schools in Japan. And at Okayama University in Japan, they recently published a research article about the efficacy of the U-Monitude program on improving empathy of medical students. And then I introduced some research about the humanitude care today. So the scientific evidence of humanitude care has been accumulated gradually. The review article about humanitude care on people with dementia and caregivers were published last year. The review showed that humanitude can reduce agitation and psychological symptoms and improve the general well-being of people with dementia. And humanitude also has a positive effect in improving care, communication, empathy, job satisfaction, and reducing burnout among caregivers. And a Japanese research team is currently working on and, um, France, Singapore, South Korea, and UCSF. They plan to do a clinical trial of humanitarian skill training program for family caregivers collaborating with UCSF. So uh, please apply the humanitude method that I introduce you in your daily patient encounter. And uh, please use at least two out of three modes of the communication at the same time, face-to-face uh, -face interaction, verbal communication, and touch interaction. So thank you so much for your kind attention. So please contact me if you're interested in Humanitude. I can tell you more about Humanitude. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kobayashi. This is just such an interesting, impressive program, and yet it makes so much sense. I can't believe we haven't been doing that in our clinical care all along. Um, I did have one question already, and I've posted to um, have people um, prompt some questions. Um, the cup that was used at the very beginning in that second video, did it have a small hole at the bottom? Um, was it being used, you know, like sometimes we used to develop a way to communicate using cups with a string attached? Sorry, uh, one more second video. Yeah, the, the where the, she was talking into his ear with a cup. Yes. Yes, here. Uh huh. Yeah, she used a uh, she used a cup, uh, and she was talking. She was uh, verbal communication using a mm -hmm. cup, and uh, also she. Uh, she used a verbal communication that is a calm and a slow. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes uh, older adults have, you know, uh, healing loss or impaired um, hearing function. So sometimes a cop is a benefit to interact uh, older adults. Yeah, so that's why she used. But other than that, so she used a multimodal communication technique. Mm -hmm. Like uh, she used uh, always two modes of communication. So like uh, um, so verbal communication and touch mm -hmm. or uh, verbal communication and eye contact. 
And then, so she used uh, multimodal communication always during uh, this care. And also the, uh, in terms of eye contact, she, uh, she used a, uh, eye contact at the same eye level. And um, uh, it's a little close. And verbal communication is a calm and a slow. And, and also she, used, she touched the uh, arms, although sometimes backs, yeah. Uh, yeah, so. Um, also, um, I wasn't quite sure about the question, but somebody was talking about um, there being a lot of sensory input and sensory overload. I'm not sure if they were reacting to the number of people that were sitting around, and I wasn't sure if that was because it was being filmed, for example, or um, whether that was an overwhelming situation for a patient to have so many people sitting around while mm -hmm. um, those efforts were um, going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. So some older adults have um, not only hearing impairment, so vision impairment. So that's why it's, oh, mm, we have to pay attention to the multiple aspects of older adults' uh, sensory. Um, and uh, Lorraine mentioned that this shows us that small changes have big results in the quality of care for patients and reduce stress for the caregivers. It's excellent because it would be easy to make simple changes with some caregiver training. Anything more that you want to add to that, Dr. Kobayashi? Um, uh, sorry, one, one more. Sorry, could you tell me more about that? Sorry. Um, the focus being a, just a very small change can have big results in the mm -hmm. quality of care. That oh, these yeah. <clears throat> are seemingly small changes, and yet you're seeing some really dramatic results as a, you know, from that process. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, in um, so for example, so in, when we think about delirium. Um, so that is a, so delirium, um, um, as I'm going to talk about the, one of the, one example, uh, so delirium is a related multifactorial, <clears throat> including acute medical issues, medication, environment factor, or uh, a lot of issues. Um, but, um, this study showed that um, just the communication skill changes uh, reduce delirium and they reduce physical restraints. Um, there's a very big impact uh, for uh, delirium in the ICU setting. Um, so previous studies showed that so delirium prevention uh, is very important compared with uh, management of delirium. So um, <clears throat> the good interaction, good communication between patients and uh, patients and uh, healthcare workers, and also uh, the reduce uh, uh, physical restraints would be benefit. And the humanity true training would be benefit to um, change for nurses, how to see patients in the ICU setting. Mm -hmm. So the nursing, the nurses' uh, thinking change can be lead to reduce physical restraints. So that's why uh, communication skill is a um, maybe a little change, but impact is very big. And um, someone also mentioned that really in some of this just going away and thinking about things and and how to approach it better just going away and coming back can sometimes help break up a difficult situation oh yeah 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 <laughs> um any other questions um from folks
there's a, a bunch of information in the chat, Dr. Kobayashi, just thanking you that it's really interesting to learn about this from another culture, but it's also being, yeah. you know, disseminated across cultures, um, which is very exciting. Yeah. Are you, um, yeah, cultural difference is very important. Um, so humanitude is created from France. Uh -huh. So when I knew the humanitude for the first time, uh, I'm concerned that I was concerned that if the humanitude program is helpful, is benefit for Japanese people mm -hmm. because it's a cultural differences. So, but um, as I uh, show the research study, so the humanitude training, humanitude program for healthcare workers and family caregivers uh, has a big impact and for Japanese people. So. Um, my understanding is that because humanitude program um, is not only concept, uh, but also uh, practical uh, skill based on the con based on the knowledge of dementia. Mm -hmm. um, so I agree with the cultural differences, but uh, patient with dementia has a little bit uh, brain damage. Mm -hmm. So based on the knowledge of dementia and knowledge of brain damage, so we can think about, uh, we have to think about the communication skills to um, uh, to interact with patient with dementia, even though the, the, the cultural differences are on the world. So that's why we, <laughs> uh, we wanted to know the universal benefit uh, communication skills to for with the patient with dementia. <laughs> well, this was just excellent, and as um, um, Hang Ren said, um, very helpful information. Um, I think Thanks it's so something much. we can all think about. Um, are you um, working with this at Rochester at this point? Yes. And how's that going? Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, I think that uh, I tried to uh, apply the humanitarian technique to the patient in the, uh, Rochester. And then, so, but the humanitarian technique is very useful to a patient with dementia in the United States. Um, so that's why um, I think it's a um, humanitarian program would be helpful uh, in the United States. Uh, yeah. But as I'm learning the uh, not only communication skill, but also uh, geriatric care in the United States. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but thank you so much for giving me the opportunity here. Oh, this was just great. Thank you so much. And everyone, I will see you next Tuesday for our last um, session of the series. And hopefully I'll have the information about next term series available for you at that same time. Bye. Thank you.